Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Stephen Rothstein, President of Perkins School for the Blind. Perkins School for the Blind has been providing education and services to the visually impaired for over 180 years. As the first school of its kind in the U.S., Perkins has been a thought leader in communication tools and assistive technologies to help blind individuals around the world build productive, meaningful lives. Stephen has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Stephen, for joining us today. Thank you. So the thing that I find so interesting about the kinds of services that you provide is that if I do this, does that make me a different person? Yet, because of the difference in how society interacts with me, I can have a completely different life. Talk about the difference between this and this. So in, in national surveys, one of the things that scares people most is losing their sight. And people who are, uh, whether they be employers or family members or educators, it's a thing they probably know the least about if they haven't had someone in, in their family. So there is a, uh, a still massive discrimination in our society. There's a very high unemployment rate because people don't understand what somebody who's blind or low vision can do. There was a study done that showed of people who are blind that are working, the average adaption cost around $500, a new piece of software or some adaption to a printer or something like that. So that on average, that it doesn't cost a lot to provide the adaption, but the perception is it's going to be overwhelming. So one of the things that we're trying to do is change that awareness with employers and let them know and about, about great opportunities. But, but you're saying that it's not really a valid argument because the costs are really not that high. It's not that high, and in fact, I'd go further, that it's a great investment for society. While I think it's the right thing to do from a human perspective, but forget that for a second. If your only focus was the economics, then if you think about a person who, who doesn't get an education and who needs support for their entire life, um, uh, well, then probably one of their parents stays home, for, into, at least when they're young, and, and supports them as well. Now, if you take that same person, and if they get a job, even making a little more than minimum wage, the difference, according to a study done in Canada several years ago, over their lifetime is $2 million. So the investment up front is tiny. For, so I think it's the right thing to do, again, from a human perspective, but if you just look to the dollars, it's also the right thing to do. So this idea that, that certain discrimination is out of bounds, but this discrimination is justified because of cost, that very often is, is really... Lack of knowledge. It's lack of knowledge, lack of knowledge. And, and, and in a sense, it's, it's a matter of adjusting your attitudes in the same way that attitudes, societal attitudes, had to be adjusted through the civil rights movement, through the various other movements in which you're basically embracing your fellows, as you would embrace a family member who is exactly. sighted, who, 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 who lacks and, sight. And this has happened, this is now Perkins' 184th year of service, mm -hmm. so, and we're the first school for the blind in the United States. Ten years after we started, we admitted the first person who was deaf and blind who ever went to school. If you read the medical literature at the time, the theory was if you were deaf and blind, it was the same as being developmentally delayed. So the issue of understanding disabilities and what it means, 40 years after that, Helen Keller came to Perkins. Right after the Civil War, 1880s, her father, they're from Alabama, her father thought she was, quote, uneducable, because all that's what all the experts said. Right. That uneducable young woman went on to go to college and do so many <laughs> other things. Yes. So we're continuing to learn so much more we can do. Six months ago, I had dinner with a woman who is, just graduated from Harvard Law School. She is deaf and blind. The first person who is deaf and blind who ever went to Harvard Law School met all of their requirements. So we're, as long as we believe in people, fundamentally believe that they can learn, give them the tools, the training, have great teachers, involve parents, have the right tools and technology, there's absolutely no limit. There's absolutely no limit for, with folks with disabilities, whether they have a mobility issue, hearing issue, vision issue, cognitive or other things. So employment is a big area. The other big area is education. That the good thing about education in our country is it's very local. The bad thing is it's very local. So you could be in one town and have a knowledgeable teacher, somebody who knows Braille, and two towns over, whatever part of the country they're in, 
and they might not know what that student needs. So that, that, that student wastes years of their life not learning Braille or other things, which is Braille is literacy for somebody who's blind. So our hope is to raise the level of knowledge in the educational space and raise the level of knowledge in the employment space so that kids who are blind have the best education they deserve and they can get the jobs that they can perform well. So let's talk about those assistive, assistive technologies. The technology has evolved very, very quickly, not only computing technology, but also uh, uh, interactive sensory uh, technologies. And that must have a big impact on people who are sightless, but also people who are hearing impaired. Um, we work on a variety of fronts. First, we work with mainstream companies like Apple and Google to support what they're doing, encourage, give them advice. So we went to Apple several years ago, with Perkins and several blindness agencies, and the Massachusetts Attorney General, and said, you're doing this screen, and that if you can't see it, you're, you're reducing accessibility for somebody who's blind. But if you put voice, every time you could touch one of the icons, you would increase accessibility. We would encourage you to do it, and the Massachusetts Attorney General is thinking about a suit if you don't do it. Well, long story short, they, di they went ahead, they, so now they're the most accessible iPhone out there. It's a great marketing thing for them, and they've sold many to people who are blind, but it's also the right thing to do, and they've, so they've made money by making it more accessible. So we encourage mainstream companies to do that, and then there are dozens of small niche companies that have, whether it be iPhones or apps or Braille printers, whatever, that we work with, give them advice, or distribute their equipment. So Perkins is now one of the largest distributor and trainer of adaptive technology in the area, and we, do, we have distributors essentially all over the world. Just as those of us with sight learn in different ways, people who are blind learn in different ways. Some like to hear it spoken, some like to have a tactile output, some like to have a braille output, so there's all different ways, and there are hundreds of soft pieces of software now and apps out there. We did a, a, a workshop for parents who have children aged zero to seven, and we found 250 apps um, on ISO and, and Android that are appropriate for them already, and I'm sure there's more every day. And by interacting with these technology companies, you're also leveraging your expertise for their benefit, but they're also leveraging their investment to benefit the sightless community. So in a sense, you're not, um, you're not having to go out and, and ask for contributed uh, revenue or even earned, earned income um, uh, in order to develop these capabilities. Um, you are creating these partnerships um, by exerting your influence, by exerting your intellectual leadership. Um, you're, you're creating an incentive to move resources into the development of technologies that then you will deploy to your constituents Absolutely. as well. We have this new partnership with Philips, a medical company, Light right. Philips Lighting. And so for somebody with low vision, there's a there's like it's like a briefcase sized box with 250 lights that can go on and off and different colors, different shapes. And we found that kids who we thought before were blind, by showing different kinds of lights, they will track it. And so we learn more about their sight and it can be an educational tool and a fun uh, game and stuff like that and a learning tool. So that we have a new product called the Light Aid with Philips that's a great partnership and will help people with low vision and those with, on the autism spectrum. So many comp companies are doing good works but are not publicizing them and are not getting the credit for the investments that they are making, um, which, which basically leaves them with a, a uh, marketing opportunity that, that they've just neglected. Uh, so is, is there a strong relationship between you and the organizations that are uh, contributing in, in such ways, or is this more of a casual um, uh, sort of opportunistic? So I think it varies a lot. We have some very strong partnerships um, Hilton folks, Unilever, Phillips, dozens of mm -hmm. others, Boston Celtics, many others, and they have it absolutely in their core, as, while they're all for-profit company, to try to make a difference in society, and they're doing making a difference either in this country or around the world. And then there are others where it's more of a, a not part of their core, and they're helping a little bit, and something we're trying to grow. Um, and, and one of the ways is through employment that there are a lot of companies that, that when they hire somebody who's blind or low vision, and they say, gosh, 
that person did a great job. They can meet the goals, they can meet the standards. So talk about your revenue model, because all of this costs a lot of money. So that is a daunting uh, challenge, to, to find the resources to continue, not only continue, but also to expand. And, and you remain on the cutting edge after 180 years. Right, so, so w we continue to lead. Uh, 10 years ago, Perkins was serving 40,000 people. Today we're serving 850,000 people. We're in 67 countries and providing- 67 countries. 67 countries. Uh, or, or in the last few months, I've been in, I, I've been in uh, Kenya visiting some of our programs, in India visiting some of our programs. We have folks all over the world. Um, and so the revenue model is, it's a very, it's, it's a mixed one. Like a lot of companies, we try to diversify. Right. So we have an education base and we, where we educate kids on our campus in suburban Boston, and that's paid for by government and private tuition. We have community services, it's a fee for service. We sell products, including the adaptive technology. We have a strong philanthropic base, and we're trying to grow that all the time. And we have an endowment, and we have some earnings from that. So from a combination of those, Perkins overall is about a 70 plus million dollar operating budget and we try to balance it with a combination of those. So when somebody says you are a nonprofit, you're not a business, what is your response? Uh, well, we're a nonprofit business and both of those are, so we are a nonprofit. Our goal is not to make a profit, but we have to operate like a business so our employees have performance reviews, our HR issues, our business, our retirement, pension, all those things operate like a business. We have a physical plant, uh, a 40 acre campus, you have to mow the lawns and all that stuff, but our goal is to provide the mission. But we can't do that if we're operating in a deficit, so we have to balance the uh, short-term needs with the long-term financial stability. So when you're, when you're hiring somebody who is a uh, chief financial officer, when you're looking at your, your computer systems that support your operating infrastructure, when you're looking at, um, at your sales force, whether it's institutional advancement, development, your marketing people, you're looking for people who are going to deliver real specific value that integrates into your strategic plan over the, for the next years. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we, we need the best people, and we get the best. We're, we're, we're so fortunate. We have some amazing people, both in program, working with students, in the fiscal, in the operations, in the physical plant, the work we do international, our library, and other things. But So when, when we recruited a CIO, we wanted the best CIO because we want the best use of technology uh, for us, as, and the same with finance, same with physical plant, all of those things. Um, their clients, so to speak, are the teachers and are the principals, and we, we have a library, an accessible library. It sends books on tape through the mail. So we serve 30,000 people through this accessible library. We're the largest accessible library east of the Mississippi. So they need a robust computer system and operations and physical plant and all those elements to run, uh, run efficiently. And when you're, when you're running this $70 million business, you're modeling the actual way that a seventy million dollar business can run with a range of different staff with a range of different uh, capabilities sightless uh, sighted uh, and and you've been strong for 180 years wouldn't it be great if other firms if more firms emulated you and and maybe they could also emulate your success and and we we have a lot of people who have a range of, of, of challenges whether it be their sight or mobility issues or cognitive or others, and finding out. And what we've done is said, okay, here's a, here's a job description. Here's somebody who may not have sight. How, what can they do for that? And we found with small adaptions, um, we don't compromise on quality, um, but for small adaptions. So we have a teaching assistant. One of the, so teaching assistants work with students. Every once a month, they may get in a car and drive. So, but we have teaching assistants who are blind. So somebody else does that piece of the job. For the few hours a month, it's, it's overall an amazing benefit. Students see a role model, and so we have folks who are blind who are librarians, who are administrators. The guy who runs our international program, who gets on a plane uh, and travels all over the world by himself is blind. And so it's hard for, it's hard for somebody, for a minister in, a, in a, a foreign country, to say, well, someone who's blind shouldn't go to school when they see him as a role model. So, so it's a great role model, and we hope that more businesses hire people 
and uh, with folks with disability. This is, the disability movement is the newest wave of the civil rights movement, and our country has come so far. Um, you know, we've just had the 50th anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech, but we still have so much to go with a variety of different types, but particularly people with disabilities. And isn't it true that people who overcome these challenges, the, the intelligence that that develops, the fortitude that that develops, the determination, the spirit, you end up with somebody who is stronger, who is more tempered, who is more capable because they have had to show it every step of the way. Absolutely. I mean, if you see, you know, somebody who has more challenges and they're able to su succeed. A few months ago, I had dinner with a, a good friend of mine who lost his sight in the embassy bombing in Kenya in, in, in the late 90s. Um, so since then, uh, he has bicycled from one end of Africa to another. He's climbed Kilimanjaro. Uh, he's a motivational speaker and has written a book. Now, I can't do any of those things. Um, <laughs> and and he does, he's done all of them. Um, so there are people like that all over the world that I've met, some who work at Perkins and some that I've seen uh, um, do a, accomplish a in academics, in music, in art. Uh, our students had an art show at the Museum of Fine Arts. When you first say, how do kids who are blind do art? Well, it's all tactile. So they did masks and so they can sense and feel what the art is like. And it was beautiful art. Um, and so our kids and the students who are blind and low vision around the world can do anything. One of the challenges today, there's four million children who are blind, four million who don't go to school someplace in the world because their government doesn't believe they have a right to go to school, or doesn't know how to educate them, in, a lot in Asia and Africa. So Perkins is in all those places, starting schools and growing schools and training teachers, because our hope is that all those children have the same rights that Helen Keller did when she came to Perkins in the 1880s. So when you are, are growing a, a network of, of international organizations that are, that are teaching, that is a very fascinating process because you have so many challenges. You have the normal business challenges of, of setting up um, a, an operating unit that emulates your success in the United States in a completely different culture. You have financial challenges, you have <coughs> leadership challenges, uh, you have to find, recruit, and keep uh, leaders. We have an international staff, and we have five or six basic principles. All kids should go to school, parents should be involved, they should, teachers should be trained, the government policy should be aligned, they should have the right technology. And we take those basic principles and figure out how to bring them to countries. And in some cases, we do it all at once, in some, it's one step at a time. So there's in China, where we spent 10 years trying to convince the government before, and they ignored us. Right. Then we found the right person in the right ministry, and, and now we were, quote, an overnight success. Now there's 29 schools. If Helen Keller had gone to school in China, in, if Helen Keller was born in China in the year 2000, she wouldn't have gone to school. There were no schools in the largest population in the world for people who are deaf and blind. Today, there's 29 of them. So there, it's the, the, the attitude was getting the right government official involved. In Guatemala, we got a parent engaged. A parent contacted us in 15 years ago and said, I want to send our, my son, who's deafblind, to Perkins, wealthy family. And we said, no, 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 let's start a school in Guatemala. So we helped her with lots of training, start a school with two kids, and then it went to four kids. Fast forward today, it has 200 kids. It's paid for by the government. So our goal is to make it sustainable and build it into lo local government support as part of that. So we go in and provide the management tools, the training, the basic principles, but we don't tell them exactly how to do it or the speed. That's up to them. Stephen Rothstein, this has been a phenomenal discussion. It is so important, uh, the work that you're doing for us all, to allow us to understand and benefit from the gifts of people who just happen to be sightless. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with us and thank you for your insights. Thank you and thank you for doing this and getting the word out. It makes a big difference. Thanks a lot.